Guys, I am here with the one, the only Diamond Dallas Page, DDP, Hall of Famer. How you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Today I'm in uh, Stockton, California. I'm getting ready to do a baseball game. They go. You know, it's great because a lot of the uh, yeah the legends, uh, all the famers, they get to uh, do these you know these tours with these baseball teams. Uh, and this is a, uh, a single A team, but I you know, go from single A, double A, triple A, and I, and I end up going out there and I don't throw that pitch because my shoulder don't really work like that. I'm not throwing anything in the dirt. So I'll, uh, I'll grab a young kid and uh, let him come out there and do the baby face thing, let him throw the ball. Um, and then, uh, then I'll sign autographs for a while and then head on down, you know, head on home. So uh, uh, today- DDP uh, yoga taking over. You're out on the West Coast now. Uh, you know, um, DDP yoga is pretty much all over the world. I'm gonna actually be going to- yeah. Hey, in September, uh, my wife is uh, Brenda. She's setting us up a tour. We start at the uh, Fanatic um, Expo, which is um, in, um, oh God, I can't remember the name now, uh, Hargate. I can't remember the name of the city up there. Um, but it's uh, it's it's a big expo that they do there, like a little you know Comic-Con thing. And we're also going to do the DDP Yoga Workshop there. Then we're going up to Scotland and do it in Glasgow. And we're not just doing DDP or workshops and signings. I'm also doing uh, an inspirational conversation with DDP, which also turns into a QA. and a And you know, all my stuff's inspiring. It's none of it's like <laughs> negative about anything. And that's just not who I am. And, uh, and then we're also gonna do uh, the Comic-Con, the signings and the workshop. So we'll be over there for three weeks. We'll do Birmingham, London, Manchester. So we're gonna be all over there. Talk about inspiring. When you gave that Hall of Fame speech, I was like, what, what can this guy say that he hasn't already said before? Much less multiple times to me. And you knocked it out of the ballpark. That that seemed like a real special moment. Obviously, it was. But you made that a special moment for, for everybody else. Oh, man. Uh, what was what was that like? Thank you for saying that. You know, I worked really hard on it. It was, it was so cathartic for me to actually prepare that. Because there was so many people from Jody Hamilton, you know, the assassin uh, back in the day, a, a legendary main eventer, uh, just an amazing worker in the ring. He was my first teacher. He was the first guy to really believe in me down at the power plant. You know, Dusty, uh, unfortunately, he wasn't here for it, but he knew how I felt. You know, being able to thank Jake in front of everybody, being able to thank Ric Flair, you know, uh, Scott, you know, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, uh, Johnny Ace, Terry Taylor, so many people. And I wanted it to chronologically go along my career. And um, I probably rewrote that speech on, I bet you I rewrote it a hundred times. And I knew I had to be somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes. And when I told them that it was, you know, might go as long as 26, 27, when they heard it, because, you know, WWE wants to hear what you're going to do. You have to remember, no matter what you want to say, it's their TV. And, may, you know, maybe there's certain guys that they don't, you know, they don't care. But, you know, like certain guys that come in, I'm sure Bruno got to say whatever he wanted to, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and Hulk or whatever. But when they heard what I planned and how I was going to do the voices, they were like, they keep it under 30 and you're good. And that was such a feeling of confidence walking out there because I knew I wasn't going to be anywhere near 30. And I knew it was funny. I knew it was heartfelt. I knew people were going to cry. You know, I knew they were going to laugh. Um, the most important thing is I wanted them to be inspired. And like, you look at my career, like I just, while I was writing this, are you familiar with uh, a player's tribute? The player tribute? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so have you, have you read any of the, a letter to my younger self? Have you read any of those? Those are unbelievable. Derek Jeter put it on the map because he did the first one that went over huge. I read his, uh, Ray Allen's is unbelievable. The basketball player, his is unbelievable. And it really set the tone for what I wanted to do because I'm actually the first wrestler that they're going to do a, a letter to my younger self. And 
it's long, like way longer than my speech. But I was trying to make it shorter and they kept trying to bring out more stuff in me. I'm like, man, this is so long. They're like, yeah, it's awesome. I go, you want it this long? They were like, yes, we love, because I'm toning my stuff down because it already sounds impossible and it was, and I did it. And not just in wrestling, because it talks about a little piece of everything, but it was so cathartic again, going through. There was times in that speech before I did it, when I was doing it to myself, or to an imaginary Dusty or whoever was there I was talking about, it would stop me in my tracks. And I would start weeping, like, wow, like this is, and it was at different points all the time. And right before I walked out there with my four daughters, I literally looked up and said, dream, pull me through this, bro. You know, and that was like, he was with me that whole time. It was super sweet. And uh, the really coolest thing was, you know, that really how it ended with such a bang. Um, you know, Ric Flair and I have had to heat with each other on and off in our career. And at some point, I didn't want that. You know, I didn't want to feel that way about Nate. I didn't want him to feel that way about me. And I had uh, talked to him at a at a autograph signing probably about eight years ago. And I just came up to him and said, Nate, you got a sec? He's like, sure. And I pulled him off to the side and I said, listen, Nate, you know, I know over our career, we've had some heat with each other. He's like, ah, Diamond, don't worry about that. And I'm like, Nate, I'm not worried about that, man. I, I'd like to fix it, man. I said, I know you, I've said some stuff. You said some stuff. I go, I don't care. I don't know how it happened. I don't care. I go, I don't want to feel like this about you, man. I love you. And I, I just don't want you to feel that way about me, man. I said, I'd love to start all over again. And I put my hand out and said, I'm Diamond Dallas Page. And he gave me a big hug. And, you know, and that was it. Like, it was over at that point. And years later, you know, I, I've always wanted to say, like, dude, like, you put me over for that first world title. You know, Sting, Hogan, and you. I mean, like, that's the, that's the night I, you know, I, I won the world title. And I'd said thank you before, but I really wanted to know how thankful I was. Because it put me... And I said it in my speech that he put me one step closer to that podium that night, you know, and I wanted to let him know that it meant a lot to me and I'll never forget it. So the night before I'm going home, I see him at the bar and I come up and we're talking and he goes, what time are you leaving tomorrow? Now we both live in Atlanta, you know? And uh, he said, what time are you going home tomorrow? I said, my flight's at 7.30. He was like, oh! <laughs> he goes, who booked that? I go, not me. He goes, fuck that. You're, you're, I got a Learjet. You and Brenda, coming home with me. And I'm like, Nate, I got bags. I got, you know me, I got all those bags. He goes, send them at FedEx. You're coming home with me. Won't take no for an answer. And that was when the, that all the storms hit that screwed up all the airlines and everything. And thank God, because I don't know how long I would have been on the ground waiting. If I'd have got there at five, you know, six o'clock or whatever, maybe not even taking off that night. But uh, we finally got out in Lear and got back. And then, you know, he found out that my birthday was the next day. And this is the same day that, uh, that uh, my DVD, Positively Living, is going on sale. Uh, it's dropping on that Tuesday. And... Uh, Nature's like, uh, now I'm taking you for dinner. Thank you. Know, he had some favorite restaurant he has up north, in North North Atlanta. I'm not, I'm not sure the area. I don't really know that area too well. But he took us, wined us, dined us, and then sent us home in a, in a limousine. <laughs> you know. He still lives the beginning of today. Rick, Rick Flair doing, you know, the limousine. And it just, I mean, it was like the amazing end of an amazing career and that i got to do it on that whole hall of fame thing and end that with nature it was super awesome so, so obviously, obviously your, your, your aid in uh scott hall and jake roberts is well publicized did you get ever any type of reception or reaction from vince mcmahon or triple h themselves about how that unfolded um i told triple h Literally, Jake had been living with me two months. When I came in to do, I believe it was the second 
I'm not sure second or third best of Nitro. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was the second, but it might have been the third. I think it was the second. And uh, yeah, it was the second. Second best of Nitro. And Paul and I, are we, we've been buddies. Like, he, we broke in the power plant together. I was 35. I was, by the time he got there, I was 36. He was 22. You know, and we were really close friends. And uh, Terry Taylor worked with us all the time. And um, then he left for New York. And when he left for New York, I called up Kevin Nash. And Nash has been my brother since, you know, back when we were tag team partners. And uh, I called him up. And, you know, he's running with, of course, you know, Scott and Kid and uh, Sean. And none of those guys should be driving. <laughs> you know, in that quartet. So I, I told him about Paul. And I said, he's a great kid. Might want to take him, take him under your wing. He don't drink. He don't do drugs. He don't do pills. Man, he'd be great to have in your crew, man. <laughs> and look what happened with him, you know. But, uh, you know, Kev did take him under his wing, you know. And uh, so did Scott. So, um, you know, for Triple H, you know, being down there and you know, being in there, I wanted him to know about Jake. I wanted him to know that Jake was coming in. And I said, listen, bro, I know this sounds crazy. Like, but I tell you, there's something different with Jake. And I think maybe, you know, maybe this, he, he might. I know I'm throwing, I'm, I'm not saying he's going to do it. I mean, I backed out of it as I was saying he could possibly do it like five times, you know, because I'm not going to nail myself. Oh, yeah, he's going to get his shit together. Like, you know, why would I think that? Now, there's no Scott Hall at the time, just Jake, you know. And then it came down to that WrestleMania. And, you know, Hall of Fame, I wanted to bring Jake with me. And you got to remember, Jake was kind of like banished from the WWE for a long time because Jake said a lot of things, you know, he probably shouldn't have said, <laughs> not probably, he shouldn't have said, but he did. And he didn't just like blow, you know, burn the bridge. He nuclear blew it up. So when I told Mark Carano, hey, man, I, I think I'm going to bring Jake with me to the Hall of Fame. He was ah, that dally on that for a minute. And uh, they, you know, they, they had to, to, to really be, be brought back into the fold. And if it's, a, if it's a, a problem with drugs or booze or whatever it is, the thing with WWE is they like you to be straight for a year. You know, they want to they wanna know, like, this is real, or at least it's a really good attempt, you know. And uh, I, it was so weird. I was doing uh, some PR for DDP Yoga somewhere in, uh, in L.A., and Paul was at the same – we were in the same building at the same time, and it must have been one of those places that had, like, 30 radio stations. And he grabbed me, hugged me, sat me down, and he told me, you know, D, not not the timing to bring Jake to the you know, Hall of Fame. Not the timing. You now he goes, you know how I feel. And then by that time, Scott's in too. You know, he's staying with me too. And uh, he's like, you know how I feel about both those guys. Like he put Jake and Scott up on a pedestal. You know, like these guys can go, and he would look to them. You know, for you know, learning everything, you know, and uh, he said, you know, how I feel about them and you know, how I feel both those guys should be in the Hall of Fame. So I know at that point he was thinking he never said it to me, but I know he was thinking, you know, these guys can stay sober, you know, and you can really help them, you know, maybe, you know, down the road. And he didn't say it, but he let me feel it like, you know, like they're not banished forever. You know, and he's going to do everything he could to help him out. And, you know, then when they did that old school Raw, where they brought me in and they let me do a commercial in the back with, you know, for DDP Yoga with Booker T and, and Ron Simmons and let me do whatever I wanted to do. Like Paul's like, pull that foot over your head, man. He goes, that's always impressive as hell. He goes, have fun with it. And then they were sneaking Jake in that night and nobody knew it. And now Jake walks out looking like a million bucks, where before he looked like death. Like, I don't know if you've seen some of the before and after, but 
they're seriously dramatic. And uh, so all those things that WWE was doing for me and for Jake, you know, so yes, they acknowledged it without coming out and acknowledging it. But I would much rather have it done the way they did it because it was, it was amazing, man. It was, it was just such an amazing ride. I know somebody that you helped out a little bit, Vader. I saw Vader was kind of going at you a little bit on Twitter. What's going on with that? I don't I really understand that. I haven't talked to him, um, but I'm going to uh, because I don't understand it. Because I, I love Leon, and, you know, I told him. I, mean, I brought him to my house, you know, um, him and his son, Jesse, who I think is just ex he's an amazing kid. And uh, he came and, you know, spent a week with me. And, and then he moved back to Dallas where he's at. And, you know, it's tough for Leon to do the program that I'm doing. Like, I was working with Jake all the time. You know, when I was helping Jake and even helping Scott, I was working with those guys all the time. And, and I explained to Leon that, you know, if you want to – I want to help you, bro, but I can't do it with you there or just coming here once in a while. I so said, I really need you. If you really want to do this, you know, and he, you know, he's got a time clock kicking, you know, he, I know he, his doctor had said he had two years to live and, you know, and that was, you know, over six months ago, seven months ago, I don't know how long ago that was, but, you know, I told him I, I wanted to help him, but I need, I kind of, I not kind of, I need him in Atlanta and I can't really help him do the things he wants to do unless he's like not wrestling. Like, if he was 40, that would be different, but he's not. I think he's – I'm 61. I think he's a year older than me. So he's around 60-something. I don't know. I don't know the exact year. But Leon, I mean, remember, 400 pounds coming off the top rope with a moonsault. I mean, I don't know anybody. He played, he played all those years of college football at a super high level, played in the NFL for five years. I mean, he's a Super Bowl champion, man. I mean, like – this guy is really beat up, and his man. Work, watch Leon in the ring. I mean, he's an animal. I mean, he's you know he's unbelievably like aggressive in that ring. That's been his nature his whole life, and like I can't really help him heal him with him doing his power bomb, not power bomb that Vader bomb thing he would do or anything like that. I just I I, I said to him, Leon, I I need you to just do autograph signings for a year. Like, give me a year to work with you. You know, I mean, that's what I want to do. So, I don't know, I got a call to him, I'm sure. You know, I'm cool. I sent him an email and, you know, and just said, you know, let's talk about this, you know, and we'll talk, you know. So I don't think it'll be a big deal in the meantime. I don't know if he has, maybe he misinterpreted me, <laughs> but I don't know how he could have because I was pretty, you know, straightforward like I always am. Like, I can help you do this maybe, you know, like, because nothing is guaranteed, you know, uh, no one ever thought I could help Jake or Scott or anybody, you know, the disabled veteran, anything I could, but it's really important to be eating the real food because that's what's going to help heal you. It's really important to be around it all the time. And the really fortunate thing I have, I have this amazing crew that work with me and they would help him all they, you know, they want to help him, you know, and he wouldn't be by himself because you know, they, they want to help them just like they, I couldn't have done it with Jake and Scott without them, you know, and it's, it's a, you know, sometimes it can be a full-time deal, but uh, again, you, you got to be around me and we got to be working towards healing you, you know, like what we did with Jake, you know, for a year, he didn't do anything. And then he got back in the ring just so he could leave the way he wanted to, you know, probably had about 30 matches and then he was done because guess what? His other hips start seizing up on him. <laughs> you know, it's like, Jake, you're in your 60s. DDT, not really a great idea. Like, Jake's doing so great right now with his one-man show that he's doing. You know, he's doing this, uh, you know, spoken word thing, as he calls. It's called spoken word, but, of course, I told Jake it was called spoken word. So he had to have the unspoken word tour, you know, which I understand. Because uh, it's Jake. And I don't know if there's a better storyteller than Jake. You know, I mean, he's such an amazing presence, has been his whole life, and, and his sure, his whole career, one of the best interviewers ever. So when he's out there doing his thing, man, you know, he, he's – He's, he's just amazing to me how he is completely now not in the ring, making a good living, 
and entertaining people the same exact way. Also, uh, to stay on a bit of the, the drama topic, there was an interview you were part of a couple months ago. You got pretty upset. It seemed like uh, the interviewer, I think it was Dan Lebitard, tried to maybe uh, bait you into I'm smearing not, people. I'm not even going to put that asshole over. I mean, he is such an asshole. I don't, you know, people try to uh, occasionally get, get under your skin, try to react. And I wasn't even doing that when he was saying what he was saying, because he, he, um, he started, and when he started, I was like, dude, do you know who you're talking to? And like, I'm like, I'm positively paid, dude. I'm not gonna go there. But what he was doing, he would hit, do you know who you're talking to? And then he, you know, hit the, you know, the, the mute button. And then he just talk over me. And that, I never do interviews with shock jocks unless I'm right there. Like, I won't do one with Mad Cow. And Mad Cow and I today are good buddies. But I was good buddies with him, too, when he started really screwing with me one day. And, man, I got really pissed. So I wouldn't do his show for years. And then he finally, like, reached out, like, come on, bro, you know, you know, I'm, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so, okay, I'll do it. And I reluctantly went. I was in Chicago. I went to his show, and Piper was with me. You know, and Pipe, you know, we, we weren't together, but we ran into each other. So Roddy's going to go out first and I'm going to come out second. And, you know, he had, they had a great time, Piper and Man Cow. And then I came out. We were having a good time. And then he starts busting my balls. Now, it isn't just the radio. There's a camera from CBS because he had the, the local station that filmed the show live. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. So you've been blowing Piper the last, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> They're like, what, you got a problem with that? You mean you got a problem with telling you that you're blowing Piper? No, whoa, 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 whoa. I go, Cal, keep talking like that, and I'll do whatever I want over here too. And then Pipe jumped in about the disabled vet that I helped, Arthur Borman, and just put it over so strong, and the whole mood changed. Now, another time with Van Cal, and this is after that a few times. He started in with me again. This time I said, screw this. I walked around his spot. Now I'm standing right next to him. I'm going to say it again, man, Cal. Say it again. And I was going to slap the fuck out of him. I didn't care. I was just going to slap. I was going to bitch slap him, you know, only because, and I probably wouldn't have because I love Cal, but he was, he was screwing with me. You know, like, don't do that shit. You're my friend. You know, I wouldn't even be on the show if you weren't my friend. You know, the, the, any of those shotguns, I have no time for them. When I went on Howard Stern's show two different times, he was the nicest guy. I, I mean, probably the nicest DJ I've ever talked to. Nice interview. I mean, he was, one time I was with Tori, which I didn't say a lot because <laughs> he was talking to Tori the whole time and couldn't blame him for that. Um, but the second time I went on with uh, Chuck Zito and he got a world of respect for Chuck Zito. Like, you better have it, because he will just bitch slap you. <laughs> Maybe might have bitch slap you, just knock you out. Uh, but Howard was always a super classy, awesome guy to me. I had a, had a couple of questions about a couple of old moments. One of, I think, the most iconic moments in WCW history. Obviously, when you hit the diamond cutter on Hall and Nash. But something that always interested me is, Right before that, you had a match with, I think, Mark Starr. Yeah. And the way that the diamond cutter was taken, it looked like you were a little upset after that. Oh, that's funny. You know, I actually had Austin look at that because they were letting me pick whatever I wanted for, you know, for the very best of Nitro. I had a lot of influence. And anything I wanted to put on myself in there, I go, no, I don't want that. You know, okay, I like that. And that's the moment right before the NWO comes out. And I've had some great matches with Mark, you know, because uh, I would always give him a hell of a match, even though I knew I was going over. You know, I want I want to make him. But that night, they took us from 12 minutes to 10 minutes to 8 minutes. By the time we're ready to go out there, four minutes. And I was so mad because I want to go out and have a match with Mark. And Kev's like, you know, Terry Terry tells me, and, 
man, I cracked. I was like, Kev, what the fuck? And I just went off. Four minutes, he's like, Dally, what do you always tell me to do? I go, what do I always tell you? Breathe. He's like, just breathe, man. He goes, what are they going to do? Cut us short? This is the angle, you know? And uh, he goes, go out there, man. Just beat them, bro. Tell them we got to go home fast and beat them. See you out there. This is your night. And I went out there and told Mark, got to go. And and he knew the spot, so I don't, I, I, I don't, I think he just was improv. I don't know what he was doing. I, I think he, I'm sure he, he wasn't trying to screw with me. You know, he was like, he just was going. So what happens, I shot him in a turnbuckle and I called bank shot diamond cutter, which means he hits the buckle. I hit the rope, bounce off and catch him, bang. Well, he hits a turnbuckle, I'm hitting the rope. And I see him like doing a Ric Flair, like doing the face bump forward. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And I jumped through the air and I probably caught him about two and a half feet from the ground, hit it perfectly, and the place popped, but I didn't hear that pop. I was like, that's not the way it's supposed to go. Cause I'm, I, you know, I can be a bit of a perfectionist. <laughs> and I said to Steve, I go, Steve, what do you think about that? You little kid, a win's a win. I'd keep it. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, you know, I'll keep it. And uh, Mark's an awesome dude. And, he was a hell of a worker, too. He was, he could really go. So I, I was more bummed out going out there, not bummed, but pissed that they cut the time because me and him could really get the crowd going, especially since he was more of in the, you know, enhancement angle. We, he could still get the crowd behind him. And, you know, I really wanted that, that, that impact before it, but it all worked. It all worked. And when Scott and Kev hugged me and Scott, you know, when, you know, went to you know, shake my hand, and when he went to pull away, boom, you know, man, the place erupted. Kev took that backdrop, you know, and went over the top rope, and, and that was really the start of, of my career. That was, that was the lighting of the rocket. They really, they set me up so good. You know, I helped both of those guys so much in our careers, and they wanted to, to, to do the favor because we started that angle 10 weeks before it was supposed to do in three weeks and then they take it off the tv and they took it off the tv and by the time it actually happened in new orleans it was like it was supposed to happen but that's not the way it was planned if it wasn't for nation hall it never would have happened so another thing I've always been fascinated with was was your TNA run. You spent about six months there. How did that come about? Like, did you reach out to them? Did they reach out to you? And what were the plans? Well, coming in, you know, Jeff uh, Jeff was in control at that time, and um, you know he wanted that. He knew that me and him had some good matches, and I was a name brand, and that coming in, it would help them get the tv that they wanted because back then they had no tv you know um it wasn't like they had spike or any of that back then um they were looking to say look at we have these main event stars we should get a bigger tv thing so it was really to help them the money was good i only had to work you know a couple i think it was um was it let's see it would do tube shows I only had to work twice a month. Sometimes I'd work five days in a month, but it went down to like two days. So it was really easy on my body. And coming in, you know, for me, it was like, if we're going to do this, Jeff, let's do some angles that lead up to it. So by the time we get together, you know, I've been made here in the company. And when you beat me, you know, it, it means more. And he was like, absolutely. And I loved working with Raven again because Raven, like to me, Raven was a top guy. I, you know, I never didn't see Scotty as a top guy. You know, just like I saw Benoit in Eddie. You know, I knew those guys were top guys. I knew at one point Jericho, you know, who ends up being bigger than everybody. You know, uh, I knew those guys would be top guys. Chris wasn't there yet, but he was on his way. You know, and look at what happened with his career, man. I mean, I don't know. 
you really think about it, Chris is one of the most decorated guys ever in, in what we did. You also worked with Monty Brown quite a bit there. He was looked at by a lot of people as a guy that TNA kind of dropped the ball on because they, they kind of just let him go. And he seemed like he was putting it all together. What did you think of Monty Brown at that time? I thought Monty Brown was a star years before he got there. I brought Bishop. It was at the end, though, but because if it would have been in the middle of my run when I helped over 30 guys get jobs – um, Monty would have been part of the crew if he had got to me earlier. You know, um, I loved his look back when he had the dreads and stuff. Uh, I mean, talk about an athlete. I mean, he was, you know, he was as good an athlete as you could get. He just needed experience in the ring. And I thought that, uh, you know, I thought that he should have been, like when people say to me, who do you think should have made it who didn't really get to that spot? Monty would be one of those guys. And it really comes down to how the company uses you, too. You know, so, you know, whoever dropped the ball there, he was a top. He was he was a guy who could have been a main event dude. And God, his energy and his natural charisma, again, could have been a, you know, if I just got with him like in 96 or 97, I think it would have been a whole different world for Monty. So what led to your, your exit from TNA? Um, I, I wasn't there for any real time. And at that time, they weren't doing anything better with the money. And again, I did, like I was 49, you know, and I wanted to come back and say, hey, look what the guy can do at 49 years old. It's not the same guy I was at 45 or 44 or 43, you know. You know, just like you see Chris Jericho, you know, he just t took a sabbatical to run with Fozzie, but Chris Blue is back out at 40 years old. And I mean, he talks about it all the time because it's true. You know, he was back in the ring in three months. So, you know, just wanting to show, I think Chris Jericho can probably wrestle. If he keeps doing what he's doing, where he takes that time off, but he's not like sitting at home. He's running all over the stage, jumping off drum risers. I mean, he's everywhere. Even, you know, even he, when he's not on TV, I mean, he's he's wrestling this weekend. Right, and he's still doing the shows in yeah. between, and he gets a great payoff, and he's not playing with his band that night, which, by the way, did you see the video, Judas? Have you seen it? You know who filmed that, pr produced it, directed it? My crew. That's Wow. That is a DDP production center video. My guys directed it, shot it, and edited it all in eight hours. I think that's his best song and video. Amazing. I mean, I think the song is killer without question. I, I, I love it. I put it on my playlist when I'm actually working out with people and stuff because I think it's an awesome song. Um, but uh, – the video is amazing, and that was Chris's idea. But um, uh, Nathan Mowry, one of my guys, who's you know, he's actually also directing an, another new movie, a new documentary that we're coming out with, and the um, the documentary is a entrepreneurial, inspirational movie, and it's about how DDP Yoga happened. And all the trials and tribulations and the second guessing and all the things along the road. And it really just shows you that, you know, like it's got a lot of heartstrings in it because it was really passionately put together and everything. But that's something I don't know where it's going to come out, but we're really close on it. And the same guy who directed uh, who directed um, J um, Jericho's video is the same guy who's been directing this uh, documentary and it's mainly putting all the footage we have so much footage you know from so much stuff we've done like from the resurrection of Jake the Snake we had over 500 hours of you know film shot to make it 93 minutes Steve Yu who's the president of my company and he's the main director who oversees 
everything, every video that goes out, you know, with our label on it. Um, he's the guy who oversees it. I'm the salt and pepper guy. I'm the guy who comes in and goes, okay, I love that. Take that, make that longer. I want to see his face. I want to see him say that. I don't want to hear it on a voiceover. I want to catch him talking to me, then go back to the B-roll. Like, that's the shit that I do. And it, 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 it's just something with me and Steve that really connects. Me and Nathan, it connects. Because today, you know, my DDP Yoga Performance Center is also the DDP production studio. And we're going to just start working with the next mayor of my town. We've done um, videos uh, that are about people's businesses that could be commercials. Uh, we're doing something like this cryo club, which is all this thing where you get in this 200 and some degrees below zero. You know, we're doing a thing for their business. Like we're getting in, we make movies, we make inspirational videos. Like Mark Merrow on his video that we did and that Steve directed about his mother has done over 75 million views. Our disabled veteran, Arthur Borman, is up over probably 100 million at this point between all of the different areas that that video is out there. So we probably got about 20 videos that we've done that have over, that are million view views, like million, like they go viral. And we're pretty good at it because we're pretty good storytellers. Is that something that you are always looking like to expand upon? Because I've noticed that like it started with the YRG DVDs and everything has evolved to the point to where like your ventures in this are branching off into different things. Well, I'm always looking to grow, you know, mentally and, you know, professionally because there's always some place else to take it. So many people get done with whatever that goal is. And we'll use weight as an example. They hit the goal, they feel great, they're doing great. I don't have any more goals and then they fall off. And then it's all a disaster. It's like, I never, I've got three goals all going at the same time right now, but they all pretty much intersect. And it's all based around the DDP brand and to me, like this DDP Yoga Now app that we've created, I mean, we haven't even started to promote it. And we have tens of thousands of subscribers already. I have never really promoted it. Is it out there? Yes, but not like it's about to be. Because first of all, you have to understand like what it is. Like so many of these apps that are fitness apps, they go, okay, first we're going to do squatting. And they show the person squatting. And they do the squatting, squatting, do 15 of those. Then you gotta go bloop. Okay, here's the next exercise you do. And you do this and you do that, or whatever the hell you do. Nothing has the workouts. And we have over 150 workouts that are on the DDP Yoga Now app. They start sitting in a chair. I'm about to film for the seniors start laying in bed. So no one can tell me I can't work out. Are you laying in bed? Can you lift your arm up? Can you lift your leg up? You can do the workout. Then it takes you to, there's five workouts sitting in a chair. You never leave the chair. But I've already had those up there that I shot with disabled veteran Arthur Borman, because that's really where he started, just starting to get the movement. Then there's five more workouts where you use the chair to balance, help yourself get up, get down. And the goal is that you can go to the beginner, intermediates, and so on workouts using that same chair, or maybe you don't need it at all. And then it goes to a different level. And the confidence and everything goes with it. That's one section. Then I've got all these amazing cooking shows that are all healthy food, real food that tastes great. I don't care how healthy something is. It don't taste great. I'm not eating it. You know, I might've done it with my wife, my daughters, uh, some of my favorite chefs, maybe somebody who lost 60 pounds, still got 60 to go like my buddy Jody. And I bring her on and she tells how she eats organically cheaply. And she tells her secrets and says, here's a new recipe that I have. And I do it with her. 
you know, or whoever I do them with. Then there's Motivational Monday. Every Monday, you're going to get a video. Boom. Motivational Monday. Here's the dates. Here's the deal. Here's what I think you should focus on. And we do that. And then, of course, there's all the tracking, your pictures, measurements, weight, pain ratio, blood pressure, blood sugar, A1C. I mean, there's no app like it, period. And again, it's really more of everything that's involved that it takes you to get there to do what you're doing you know and we're just we're starting to make videos around that and show you how easy it takes it from just taking your phone and go bloop and you're on the tv i mean it's that simple but it scares people so they use dvds which i'm don't have a problem with that either but i want to help people move along like forever people use cds now very few people have cds it's all right here and that car doesn't even have a cd player anymore right they don't even make it they this 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 apple computer which is three years old doesn't have a uh, a place to put a dvd or a cd you have wow. to put an extension for it because it, it's going to be obsolete within the next couple of years it'll be obsolete dallas man thank you so much uh absolutely if there's anything you ever need to promote you know to get a hold of me man all right, buddy. You know, just uh, we're constantly, anybody wants to follow me, like I said, I'm going to be in the UK. Did we talk about that, right? We talked about the UK? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to be out there. If you want to know where I'm at, where I'm going to, just go to diamonddollspage.com or ddpyoga.com and sign up on the mailing list. Um, you know, people have heard me say it a million times. I'm going to say it again. Don't listen to what I have to say about my program. Go on Twitter. Hey, me, I I was never going to be able to take a bump, probably never going to be able to grapple again. I did DDP yoga. I, I couldn't feel two of my fingers in my right hand. And now I, I can take bookings. I can do grappling tournaments. I can get in the ring. I can uh, train. It, it changed my life. It's I'm a big, big, big advocate of DDP yoga. It really changed my life. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. You know, anybody out there want to know more about it, go to ddpyoga.com. And again, at real DDP at DDP Yoga on Twitter. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot to tell you. Uh, Instagram. Oh, everyone's saying, get your own, get your own Instagram. I'm like, I don't need it. I got at DDP Yoga. Like, no, you didn't know. <laughs> so now I had to get my name back, but now it's at Diamond Dallas Page. And I every every week I am doing a live Q and A, and I'm only answering wrestling questions at nice. balancepage.com so you can ask me questions right there my uh social media girl rachel she asks as you ask she asks me as you ask so how does one go about getting their instagram name back do you gotta pay somebody off do you have to con contact instagram well because you know i have um what do you call it the little authentic check or whatever that is verified my yeah verified right well, they said, I work for Diamond Dallas Page. That's his name. He owns that name. So, you know, you just have to be persistent. Find the people that do it on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And I did it and I got it back. So, works nice. for me. Dallas, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, but it's been your pleasure. See ya. Ah.